The results of the scan came as a surprise to paleontologists. In an effort to digitally restore a fossilized skeleton embedded in a lump of sandstone, a team of scientists took the block, about the size of an American football, to the ESRF, a high-tech research facility in France, to scan it with a synchrotron. The specimen was discovered in 1975, when a paleontologist working in South Africa first hacked away at the lump of sandstone with his rock hammer to see if it was worth collecting. There seemed to be more bones inside, so it was then taken to be stored in the fossil collection of a university in Johannesburg, South Africa. At first, all that was exposed on the surface was a tiny snout tip protruding from the sediment, but that's all it took to identify the animal, Thrinaxodon, an extinct fox-sized creature. But Thrinaxodon was no fox. It was far stranger. While we can tell by the pits on its face that it had whiskers, nobody knows if it had fur anywhere on its body. The articulation of its arms and legs, pelvis and shoulders means that when scampering after small prey, Thrinaxodon's legs would have sprawled just slightly outwards on either side of its thin frame, but less so than other reptiles of its day. But unlike typical reptiles, which carry mouthfuls of identically shaped teeth, Thrinaxodon had multiple types of complex teeth crowding its jaws. A decent number of Thrinaxodon fossils have been found not just in South Africa, but also Antarctica. That's because 260 million years ago, long before the dinosaurs even, back when all of Earth's dry land was locked into a single great landmass, the little carnivore would have called Pangaea home. Thrinaxodon hails from an ancient line of reptiles called Theriodonts. Some theriodonts, like the carnivorous Gorgonopsians, grew to be bear-sized, and 200 million years before the earliest cats, they had already evolved the first saber teeth, which they used to sink into cow-sized, herbivorous reptiles that once roamed across Pangaea. That was the Permian period, a chapter in Earth's history some 260 million years old. But that was then, and for Thrinaxodon, this was now, because the extinction didn't leave much of anything alive. The Great Dying, technically called the Permian-Triassic Extinction Event, washed away 96% of ocean life and wiped 7 out of 10 land animal species from the face of the Earth. While the precise causes of the disaster are unknown, environmental changes set in motion by a series of massive volcanic eruptions in Siberia, which correspond roughly with the pulses of extinction that ravaged the Earth, probably had a hand in the destruction. Pangaea, including what we now call South Africa, was left a changed world. What was once a green land of rich, wet woodlands filled with an assortment of unique and enchanting animals had been reduced to a dry, bland landscape, completely devoid of large animals, where you'd be lucky to spot even the smallest patch of green. The discovery of Thrinaxodon bones from both before and after the extinction means that it was a survivor, among the few animal species to make it through the catastrophe. Part of its success was surely linked to its small size. While their giant gorgonopsid forebears had to hunt and kill often to feed their giant bodies, the small dimensions of Thrinaxodon allowed it to survive on very little by comparison. But another clue to their survival can be found in what remains of ancient soils. As the extinction event was altering climate, killing species, and collapsing food chains, Thrinaxodon could be found below the surface, where it hid from the groans of the wounded and dying animals where it was freed from the sting of the midday sun, and where it laid just out of reach of the snapping jaws of desperate carnivores. Some burrows have even been found with their primeval occupants intact, even pairs of them from the same burrow, little Thrinaxodon, still curled up after their chambers were caved in or flooded. This is what the team of paleontologists scanning that sandstone lump in France thought they would see, but as the images came through, slice by slice, Layer by layer, they were greeted by an unexpected surprise. Not only was there an entire Thrinaxodon, every bone preserved with delicate precision, but another skeleton, just as complete, had been hiding next to it for 251 million years. From a group of amphibians called the Temnospondyls, Brumistiga was a relic from a time long before 
when the Earth was dominated by salamander-like creatures. How two animals, separated by leaps and bounds on the Tree of Life, ended up dying in the same burrow was puzzling to say the least. But the answers may be found in the bones of the Brumistigia itself. We know that the amphibian was a young individual, still not fully grown, and the scans revealed that it was far from healthy. In fact, it was badly crippled. A series of broken ribs must have made tasks as medial as walking and breathing a painful challenge and puncture wounds just above its eyes tell us that it had survived an encounter with another animal not long before death. The exact spacing of the bite marks is wider than the canines of the Thrinaxodon in the burrow, so it must have been attacked by some larger, unknown predator lurking at the surface. A young amphibian, wounded and slow moving, wouldn't have stood much of a chance exposed in the gaze of the thirsty, midday sun while desperate predators stalk in search of easy prey. Its instincts told it to find shelter, and so the lone Brumistigia stumbled across a place to hide from the dangers of this new world, and so it descended down the shaft of a burrow. As for what happened next, there are two scenarios. Perhaps the creator of the burrow was already dead when the limping creature arrived, and the amphibian found itself in a cold, dark tomb, met by a lifeless figure, a dry mummy that perished from thirst or disease. Or maybe, when Brumistigia sloped down through the shaft of that underground lair, it was greeted by warmth emanating from the slender figure curled up below. And after reaching the bottom of the chamber, the silent, motionless figure gave the illusion of lifelessness. It was completely stiff, aside from the steady rise and fall of its belly. It was nearly silent, apart from the breaths escaping from its wet nose. And it was here next to the sleeping creature, that the amphibian had finally found a place to escape from the dying Triassic world above, where it could hide from the torturous sting of the midday sun, where it could escape the jaws of hungry survivors, and where, at last, it was freed from hearing the groans of the wounded and dying animals, and most importantly, a place to recover from its wounds. So, it settled in to rest next to the jaws of that hungry survivor, sleeping in the darkness. There's some evidence that Thrinaxodon could self-induce a sort of hibernation called estivation, an adaptive strategy used to help get through tough times. When the conditions outside became too unbearable, when food was too scarce, when the drought was lasting just a little too long, Thrinaxodon could slip into a deep slumber, where its survival depended on the chance that by the time it could wake up, perhaps several days later, the rains will have come and what had been just a series of empty, sun-baked potholes would be filled to the brim with life-giving water. Eventually, the rains did come, and when they did, it poured, and it poured, and it poured, and the co-inhabitants of the den were drowned by a flood invading the arid region preserving the Thrinaxodon and the wounded Brumistigia as they were in their final moments. While the Temnospondyl amphibians persisted for another 130 million years, they would ultimately go extinct. But it was from small cynodont survivors like Thrinaxodon that the first mammals would eventually arise, hence the strange blend of reptilian and mammalian features. It was nearing a crossroads in the history of life, and at the end of this trail were cats and dogs, bats and squirrels, giraffes and whales, human beings. For it's from creatures like Thrinaxodon that we owe our own existence. In stark contrast to the collapse and disarray of life above ground, the pair of neat little skeletons, still pristine in the eons since their hard life, remain in that 251 million year old lump of sandstone to this day where they've since been put back on a shelf in a South African fossil collection. The two little skeletons, woven together over a canvas of Pangean soil, are nothing short of a Triassic masterpiece, proof that even in the aftermath of the greatest catastrophe in history, life will never be depleted of its grandeur. <laughs>